All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day. While we would have loved to host you in person this year, we're glad that we can at least connect with you virtually. We have a great itinerary of engineering faculty, current students, and a phenomenal keynote address for you in this virtual space today that we hope you'll be able to connect with and find inspiration from. My name is Amy Price, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Parks College. I'll serve as the webinar host today as we move from one session to the next. All sessions today will be hosted in this webinar and via YouTube Live, and you may use the link emailed to access each session throughout the event. We will be recording each session, and we'll have that posted to our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Parks, in the coming days. If at any point today you experience technical difficulties, we recommend first logging out and logging back into the webinar with the link provided by email. If other issues persist, please email parksevents at slu.edu and we'll provide what assistance we can. As you will learn today, the engineering industry offers a multitude of opportunities and careers. All of the professionals and students you'll meet during this event are excited to introduce you to what they do in their careers and in their studies and to maybe help you find your passion as well. In total, St. Louis University offers engineering programs in aerospace, biomedical, civil, computer, electrical, and mechanical engineering. We'll be highlighting several of these programs throughout this event today. We do ho hope that you will hear or see something you'd like to learn more about. At any time, please send us an email at parksevents at slu.edu to connect further with our programs. For teachers who are logged on today, we're more than happy to set up virtual guest speakers or virtual lab tours from our faculty and students to connect middle school and high school age students with the opportunities that await them in engineering. Right now though, for our exciting day planned ahead, we'll begin with three lab tours to various spaces around our engineering buildings on our campus in St. Louis, Missouri. These tours will be hosted by three of our faculty members and they'll share a bit about themselves and their programs with you. After these lab visits, I'll be launching an innovation challenge that all students are invited to participate in over the next week and submit designs for a prize of a virtual gift card. After that, we'll host a current engineering student panel when you'll get to meet and hear from four of Parks College's current students. You'll also be able to submit your own questions to them during that session. And finally, the event will conclude with a keynote address from one of our graduate students, Crystal Bell, as she shares her journey in the engineering field and how she combined her passions with her skills. Please refer to the event schedule that was emailed to you for more detailed information about these sessions and times over the next two hours. If at any point during these sessions, you have a question about the content, please submit those to the Q&A feature through Zoom or to the comment section on YouTube Live. Time may not always allow in each session, but if it does, we'll get to those questions as best we can. And so now, after that introduction, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Gorlowitz for our first virtual lab visit to the Chrome Lab and Mechanical Engineering. And I'll get Dr. Gorlowitz pulled over here. All right, there she is. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me and see me okay? Yes, looks and sounds good. I'm going to disappear and let you take it Great. from here. Thanks, Amy. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. We're incredibly excited uh, to at least be with you virtually. While I wish you were all here touring our campus and seeing our labs, um, I, I hope that we get to at least you get to see a couple of cool things today on our, our, on our virtual tour. So my name is Jenna Gorlowicz. I'm an associate professor here in mechanical engineering at SLU, and I direct the Chrome Lab. So Chrome stands for collaborative haptics, robotics, and mechatronics. And that's a lot of big words. But what we do is we design really cool systems to work with people. So you can, I think we can all relate to, to systems that we work with, whether it's our phones or our tablets or our computers. And oftentimes we experience these frustrations with them. 
And sometimes it's because of technological limitations, which we work on, and other times it's because of poor designs. So what we focus on in the Chrome Lab is designing what we call multimodal, which means we try to engage people through all of their senses, vision, hearing, and touch, uh, to, to, better, to better the experience overall and to make it easier to use and to work with smart systems. So today in the lab, you're gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple of projects that we're working on and you're gonna get to meet just a couple of our students and, and hopefully you'll, you know, you'll find something that's interesting to you. And I'll try to close with a couple of things about mechanical engineering broadly uh, to, to maybe pique your interest in the field. So I'm gonna start with a project that we work on with touch screens. So we're all familiar with touch screens. Um, touch screens have basically transformed the way that we, we access information. The problem with touch screens is that they're highly visual. So in order for me to operate this, I have to look at it, right? Can you imagine for a second closing your eyes and trying to do something on your touch screen? It's really, really, really hard. So it's kind of funny that they're called touch screens because we really don't do much with touch with them at all. And so what we're looking at in this lab is how do we bring touch, true touch back into touch screens? And we're looking at this in the context of how we might make graphics accessible to individuals who are blind or have visual impairment. So we can all envision that math class that we sat in where we were learning about graphs, right? And we were sitting there and the way we learned about graphs was we looked at them. The question is, how do you learn about graphical information when you can't see it? And it turns out that you can learn through touch and individuals with blindness and visual impairments have demonstrated this to us. But what we wanna understand is how do we bring touch back on these surfaces? that are basically just screens. And so what we do is this is just a simple line, but the cool part is when I put my finger on the line, I'm feeling a vibration. It's really hard virtually because you can't feel the vibration, but I feel a little buzzing underneath my fingertip. And when I move off the line, I don't feel it anymore. And then we can also combine, combine auditory feedback. So when I'm here, it's voicing to me end point, start point. So we combine both the, the auditory, the visual display, and vibrations so that people can perceive graphics through all of their senses. And we're starting to look at how we expand this project. So we can do this with lines, we can do this with graphs, we can do this with points, but in the end of the day, it's still a flat surface, right? And that can make it difficult. So now we're looking at how we can connect smart devices. Like this is a square, right? But I can transform it into trapezoids and parallelograms, and I can make this device smart by putting sensors on it, which can be connected to something like a tablet so that it reads out to me, this side is eight inches, this side is five inches, and I can start to get information from it. And then we're even looking at how we design really, really tiny robots. So this is, I took it apart so you could see the insides. You can see this little board here that carries all of the electronics. This is a battery to power it. Here's two wheels on the bottom and there's a little motor inside that spins them. And we're actually designing these little robots to drive on the touchscreen to important points so that you can find them really quickly. So this touchscreen example is just is one example of a project that we work on the lab. A common theme that you're going to hear is that we're really interested in understanding how we design technologies so that they are multimodal, so that access for anyone, regardless of sensory orientation, is no issue. So now I'm going to turn it over to my student, Brian, who's going to show you another project that we're working on. Hi everyone, I'm Brian. I'm one of the graduate students in Dr. Gorlitz's lab. Um, so as she was saying before, uh, what I do is a little bit of wearable haptics. So she was talking about touch screens and about 3D devices. Now this is the ones you can actually like put on you and get different sort of sensations. So um, the whole reason for this project is we're working with deaf and blind individuals to help create touch sensations that are really intuitive. So if I just brought this to you, I put it on your arm and I played a signal and you would be able to tell me exactly what it was because it would just make sense, it's intuitive. So going off of that, you can do stuff for like, you can see here, all of these motors, I can get them to move and with different kinds of commands that I input to them. And then on the, the hand, these are all like vibrations. And these are like the little motors that are inside of your phones that make them vibrate. But I just put them on here and I can draw patterns. I can make like shapes. I can uh, give you directions with it. I can go like this way and this way to make, tell you make like a left turn, 
all sorts of fun things like that. And so um, we're expanding this project. We want to, right now it's just on the arm, but we want to incorporate like the legs and then eventually even some of the body. So think about it like a full body haptic suit that can give you all sorts of touch and vibration sensations. Um, like if someone was sitting next to you and like tapping on your arm or tapping on your leg or like trying to poke you to get your attention, that sort of idea. So pass you back off. Great, thanks, Brian. And the cool part about that project is that we're working with uh, deafblind individuals as collaborators. And so what's really interesting in the deafblind community, there's sort of a movement that's been dubbed the pro-tactile movement. And essentially what this pro-tactile movement is, is th this group of individuals has developed a language where they can communicate everything purely through touch. And so they sit with one another and, and using various um, intuitive human touch gestures, they can talk with one another. And so you can imagine sitting next to one another or maybe the analog is if you're texting a friend and, and they're texting back, you can see the three dots, right? That's a very simple form of communication called like back channeling where you know some information is coming, you know they're still there, you know they're still present and you're expecting something from them back. Well, the way that well, the way that's done in protactile language is something like a tap, 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 tap. And it kind of, in your head, you can think of, uh-huh, uh-huh. So it's a form of simple feedback that gives you information that someone's still there, they're still following along, and that they're tuned into the conversation. So we're looking at how we can sort of leverage the human touch capacity in new ways with these wearable haptics. So the last project that we're gonna highlight, I'm gonna turn over to my graduate student, Maya, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about. Now I'm going to talk to you about this lovely robot here. So right now. Hey, hey sorry to interrupt Maya. Could you get a little closer? We're oh, having yeah, trouble sure. here. Thank yep. you. Okay, cool. So I'm here to talk to you about this robot today. So we are on Zoom right now, right? And the great thing about Zoom is it allows us to communicate with people who aren't necessarily right next to us or around us. Um, and so be able to see them and interact with them and have a more fulfilling experience. But at the same time, there are still some things that are lacking. Um, we communicate not only through verbal and visual communication, but also haptic communication. So like Dr. Gorlowitz was talking about and how Brian was talking about, right? We use touch a lot. Um, and that's one thing that's missing in lots of e-communication. So we decided to design this robot basically um, in order to help out with that. So its primary focus is to allow you to um, basically do a lot of some basic, simple um, touch communication uh, that you usually couldn't do otherwise. So for example, uh, we can rotate this arm, actually my laptop's in the way, so you can rotate it back and forth, um, you can lift it, and so from, and a whole bunch of other things. You can bend the elbow, so with a lot of these movements, uh, we can allow for lots of different kinds of communication. So for things like waving, handshakes, um, all sorts of other, um, I guess, communication techniques that we use on an everyday basis, uh, giving a more, even more fulfilling experience to things like Zoom and otherwise. So, that's basically what this robot does. And hopefully um, what we'll get to is we'll figure out ways to allow for users to control this robot in ways where it doesn't take away from you trying to communicate with somebody else, where it becomes more intuitive, um, where it's not like something you really are thinking about, it's more just something that you add along to any sort of communication process. Great, thanks Maya. And so, yeah, as Maya had mentioned, kind of what we're looking to understand in this project is you know, how do people feel socially connected when we're apart, right? And so when we walk into a room, we might say hi. If it's a formal introduction, we might shake someone's hand. Um, and then while we're talking, and you can see me doing this, we often move our hands, right? And that provides additional information to the person that we're communicating with. But all of that gets lost when we're, when we're communicating over video and audio. And so the question is, if we can bring it back and we're demonstrating that we can, is it useful? 
right? And how would people want to use it? So if you could tune in and the way telerobots work is you would tune into this platform and your face would show up on the screen up there. And so then all of a sudden you're embodied in this platform. And then on your computer, you control what the platform does. So you control it waving, you control it reaching out to, to uh, shake someone's hand. And if you could control that, the question is, would you want to, right? Because there's always questions in robotics about how much is too much and where does it become eerie, right? Or creepy and where does it become meaningful? And so we're trying to understand the role that touch plays in making this meaningful. Right, and now the robot's like nicely waving and showing you all the acrobatics that it can do. Thanks, Maya. <laughs> um, so this is just a sampling of the projects that happen in the Chrome Lab. We do lots of different, um, there's lots of other projects that are going on in different applications, including medicine, education, hockey for the blind, but kind of the common thing among everything that we do is how do we raise the profile of technology to support what we want to do as humans and not hinder it? And that's a really, really fun, uh, that's sort of a, a really fun, impactful way to think about engineering. So I think I'll close with, you know, you might not have thought of mechanical engineering as this, right? Mechanical engineering is a really broad discipline. Um, it includes all kinds of industries, right? But at the end, what you're learning to do is to design systems. And our work has also an electrical component tied within it, right? So it has what we would call a very mechatronics feel. Um, but you can do so many things when you start to get into engineering, into design, and when you work with people, which is what we do in this lab, we work iteratively with the design of our technologies so that they, they serve individuals' needs, that becomes a really compelling career. Um, so I think I'll stop here, um, and I look forward to, to all the other great things that you guys are going to see. And if you have any questions, again, my name is Jenna Gorlowicz. You are more than welcome to email me, check out our lab website, and let me know what you're thinking. Thanks so much again for tuning in. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorlowicz and Brian and Maya for showing us around. We have just a couple minutes, and I was wondering if I could pose just a question about the, the process, and maybe this is the process at large for all engineering disciplines, but you know, you've got these, these great technologies that you're working on now. Did it begin as someone going, oh, look, I think I can design a robot that can wave. We need to find an application for it. Or did it begin as someone saying, we have this problem and then, and then finding the correct technology for the solution? Yeah, much of, that's a great question. Um, much of what we do is people driven. So it often begins with, we see a need, right? And I think it's very important to understand that as engineers, we can and, and should make a societal impact, but we need to make sure that the things that we're designing actually have the chance to do that, right? And so oftentimes the needs or the problems that we're trying to help address require input from the people who have the needs, right? So we can never put ourselves in a position where we assume that this is a need and that our solution fits it. And oftentimes, almost every time, the first solution that we come up with is not the end one, right? And so we, we somebody says, this is sort of, this is kind of the need that we have. This is the problem that we have. And we take it back and we come up with a couple of quick mock-ups or quick prototypes of things that we think could help and we let them try it out. And then they tell us, well, this doesn't work because, or I wouldn't use it this way because of whatever. And having that context is really important in all of engineering, not just in mechanical engineering, but in all engineering disciplines and sort of making sure that the solution that you develop is one that has the chance to make an impact. Excellent. Thank you so much again, Dr. Gorlowitz, Maya, Brian, uh, for that visit to Bye, the time lab. <laughs> All right, and hang on just a moment. I am gonna pull our next presenter over. All right, and we'll be heading to the Water Institute next with Dr. Cox, and I see she just logged in. Okay, Hi. great, I will let you take it from here, okay? Thank you. Um, really quick, I'm gonna, oh, uh, there's no screen sharing, that's fine, okay. so. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Amanda Cox. I'm really excited to share with you information. It's fine. Share with you information about civil engineering. Um, it's uh, arguably one of the most versatile fields of engineering, and it's focused on infrastructure projects 
and systems in both the public and private sector. So it really has a very wide ranging um, uh, areas from roads and bridges, canals and dams, um, airports, also uh, buildings, uh, the structural components of buildings, um, sewer systems, and then even within civil engineering, we can break it down to subdisciplines that are really based on different science areas. So my field is in hydraulic engineering, which is applied fluid mechanics, which is a, an area in physics. We also have structural engineering that falls under the civil engineering umbrella. Um, of course, that's uh, uh, statics and, and dynamics, uh, another subdiscipline of physics. Um, there's geotechnical engineering that deals with soil mechanics, environmental engineering that has a really strong focus on um, chemical processes and biological processes. And primarily in civil engineering, one of the key aspects is treatment of water, whether it's drinking water or wastewater. And um, the last kind of area in civil engineering is transportation engineering. So um, you can think of a lot of the infrastructure projects that are, are under the civil engineering umbrella may have uh, multiple disciplines within there, whether you're having to deal with stormwater runoff or roads or parking or structural components, or even with buildings, you have to think about the foundation and the soil that it's setting on. So these are all sort of interrelated in several civil engineering disciplines. Um, I also wanted to introduce um, Sophie Liang. She's our new lab manager here at our, our new space in the Interdisciplinary Science and Engineering Building. She comes from the university or Iowa State University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Iowa State University and she has her undergraduate degree in, envi uh, in environmental engineering. Environmental engineering, yeah. Master's degree. Yeah, and a master's degree in environmental engineering and in environmental science. She's finishing that up this semester. So she just joined our team here um, really a few, like a month or so ago. So um, we're excited to have her here. So as I mentioned, we, we do have a new um, uh, research space in, in the new building on campus here. And um, like I said, my area of expertise is hydraulic engineering. And in addition, to the work that I do uh, in research and teaching in that area, I'm also the director of the new Water Institute at St. Louis University. And the Water Institute, it's an acronym that stands for Water Access, Technology, Environment, and Resources. And it's um, focused on interdisciplinary research to address many of the critical and persistent water-related challenges that we have. Um, these include things like um, access to clean water or um, reducing the impacts of water-related natural disasters like floods. Um, and then also protecting aquatic ecosystems. Those are kind of the three um, arms that we focus on here. Um, you know, the built environment, which is like infrastructure, aquatic ecosystems, and social justice aspects related to water, under which clean water access falls on, on, under that umbrella. Um, what we found when we were when we were um, creating this institute is that these are all sort of interrelated um, and, and they're complex areas as well. And they require, um, in addition to the science and engineering, they require considerations around policy and economics and social justice and public health. So really the focus of the Water Institute is to bring together um, experts across the university in several disciplines to work on these critical issues. Um, so, uh, for, for the work at the Water Institute, we actually have several undergraduate researchers and graduate researchers um, that, that are working on research projects for us. I think we have maybe about 17 undergraduate research assistants and um, 15 graduate research assistants. Um, I wanted to highlight a, a few of the projects that, that I'm working on, and then we can um, give a tour of these labs that we have here in the new building. So um, the two projects that I'll, that I'll highlight, um, one is uh, funded by the Army Corps of Engineers, and what we're doing is they have a database that has information about um, all of the reservoirs in the United States and how much volume or capacity storage in those reservoirs um, are available. So we're using um, machine learning and sort of uh, informatics and, and big data to come up with methods for estimating 
the, the loss of that capacity due to sedimentation processes from rivers. So, um, you know, uh, the rivers that are feeding into these reservoirs carry a lot of sediments, whether it's sands or gravels, and ultimately they fill over time. And so we can use information about the area that's draining into the reservoir or geological characteristics of the areas that are draining into the reservoir to estimate what that um, rate of sediment filling is. And I have um, uh, one graduate student on that and an undergraduate student that's really helping me pull data from several data sets online. Um, the, um, the second project is one for the Missouri Department of Transportation. And the focus of that project is looking at scour around bridge piers. So scour is when the water erodes away the, the material near the foundation of the pier. The piers are the, the columns that are supporting the, the, the bridges across the river. And, and if the, that material is scoured to a certain extent, the bridge can fail. And so it's a very um, big concern and something that we have to check for all bridges that are designed. And so we're um, doing a study of five different bridges across Missouri, ranging from sort of large bridges to small bridges. And we're doing um, numerical modeling to simulate the flow around those bridges and, and how much, um, how fast the water's moving. And then ultimately the forces that are eroding that material and then we'll look at an estimate of the maximum amount of erosion that can occur. So I have a couple of undergraduate students that are helping out with that. It, it includes field data, collection, surveying, um, collecting soil samples at the sites, and then also um, numerical modeling as well. So uh, with that, I'm now gonna give you a tour of our, of our new lab space. And these lab spaces are for the Water Institute. And they're in the Interdisciplinary Science and Engineering Building. We have over um, 3,600 square feet of new space here. Uh, we, we just got this space in um, at the end of the summer. And it includes lab space, office space for um, faculty and, and graduate students. Um, for the labs, we have three of them that we're going to look at. One is the hydraulics lab. Uh, the second is a wet chemistry lab, and the third is an instrumentation that room, room that includes all of our high-end analytical equipment. Okay, so Sophie's going to help me as we walk around the lab here, and we're going to try to make this work. Um, all right, let's come over to this area. We're, we're in the hydraulics lab now. And uh, what, what we have here, and I'm going to, I know my camera is not great on this particular um, computer, but this is a flume that we can use to study river engineering, uh, river processes for river engineering purposes. We can reconfigure this table um, uh, to have different slopes or a different amount of water flowing in it. And, and we can look at uh, these uh, river processes that form rivers and sort of dictate how they behave. So whenever we're doing engineering design around rivers, we have to understand um, how the rivers move sediment. And this, in this table, the sediment is um, simulated by small plastic particles, um, but they are very much similar to sand in terms of their size and their angularity. Um, one of our recent studies, we were able to film the movement of these particles and using image processing techniques, um, you know, processing the different frames within the image, we're able to determine how fast the move particles are moving using a tech called particle image velocimetry. Um, and then once we, once we were able to look at that, we we're able to connect that to um, the forces in the flow and really make a direct connection between the stresses in the flow that are moving the particles and how fast they're moving or, or the volume of particles that are moving. Um, some of the things that are important for sediment transport here, the size of the particle, and then also the distribution of sizes of the particles. And in this flume, you can see we have um, black particles, white particles, and, and yellow particles. And the different colors indicate different um, particle sizes generally. The yellow ones are the, are the coarsest particles, and then the um, black are the uh, finest particles. OK, let's move over to the, the, next, um, the next lab here. This is our wet chemistry lab. And we're gonna highlight this, uh, this setup that we have right here. And um, so this work, this work is being done by um, Crystal Bell. 
and Jacob Slotikowski. He, they're both um, former, one's a, currently an undergraduate student and the other is a, a master's student, but a former undergraduate student. And they're looking at testing a number of different filters, point of use filters, um, that are commonly used in developing nations to see which ones are the most effective. Um, yeah, so they've got a number of different setups here where they're looking at a variety of different filters. If there's anything else here. Okay, let's come over to, um, in the wet chemistry lab, we have a number of benches and flumes, um, but we also have a, this a piece of equipment called the um, Hot DR6000. Um, this one is used to measure water quality parameters and drinking water, including fluoride, chlorine, and UV-254. Uh, let's go to the instrumentation room next because it has some of the more exciting pieces of equipment that we use to analyze water quality. We're doing okay. Okay. We're doing okay on time. <laughs> This is our newest piece of equipment, and it's called a um, QTOF, or a quadrupole time of flight. Um, this uh, instrument is used to measure molecular uh, concentration of compounds. Um, it's used to determine the, uh, the, the structure of the compounds. Um, and one of the things that we can use it for are to detect cyanotoxins, which is um, a contaminant that's in water and it can be naturally developed from harmful algal blooms. So um, we're just now getting this set up and it's, it's being used for one of the um, technologies or one of the research projects that we have. Let's look at one other piece of equipment. This one is, this one's the Shimatsu um, HPLC, and that stands for High Pressure Liquid Chromatograph. Hard to get that one out there. Chromatography. Yeah. It's uh, used to measure organic contaminants such as pesticides, cyanotoxins, and other uh, regulated compounds in drinking water. It uses ultraviolet detection, um, and we'll soon be up upgrading it to include fluorescence detection as well. Um, that, that, that is, this is our instrumentation room. I'll show you one other space um, here. We have a really nice, because this is a brand new laboratory space. We do have a really nice cold room that stores a lot of our water samples. If you can see in here, it's a little hard to see, but we have a number of our water samples. But this is a, a great feature that we have in our, in our new lab space. So we'll, um, we'll set the laptop down here and um, we'll see if there are any questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Cox. And Sophie, so nice to meet you. Welcome to SLU. And thank you for, for sharing your time with us today. We do have a minute. If anybody has a question, feel free to submit it to the Q&A. Um, I'm, I will kind of just to, just to get a feel of everything because the Water Institute is so um, interdisciplinary and collaborative and there are a multitude of various water issues, both domestically and globally. Um, how often do researchers get out of the lab space and, you know, go to a site visit? Or how often are people traveling and, and looking at waterways themselves? Yeah, so actually really quite often. Many of our faculty do, um, uh, the, the projects are field-based. And so whenever we're, we're analyzing these water samples here in the lab, but we have to go out and actually collect those and document where they're collected and even take some measurements there on, on site. And so there's a really large field component to this. Um, like I said, for the, for the Pier Scout project that I'm doing, we're gonna have to go out and, and survey some of these bridge piers with some um, high-end survey equipment that can measure um, uh, surfaces under the water. Uh, so there's, there's a really strong lab component to it. Not lab, sorry, field component. But I would argue that uh, most of my research too right now is really, um, has a high numerical modeling sort of data-driven machine learning component to it. And so as, as those methods are continually being improved, we find new ways to apply them to water resources to where we can um, get a better understanding and have new methods to manage and analyze 
and design water resource systems. Gotcha, gotcha. It just all seems so exciting and, mm -hmm. and so important of what you're doing. So I wanna thank you both again for showing us around the Water Institute. Um, I'm gonna send you back to the other side now. Thank you, have a good uh, rest of your morning. Thank you. All right, and next up we have a visit to the Soft Tissue Engineering Lab. So I will bring over Dr. Zustiak. Let's get her logged in. All right, Dr. Zustiak, hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for showing us around today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you take it from here. All right, well, well welcome everyone virtually to the Soft Tissue Engineering Lab here in Parks College. And uh, I'll tell a little bit about what we do and then I will show you some of the work that my students currently are performing. Um, so our work is focused on hydrogel biomaterial for tissue engineering applications and also drug delivery. So if you don't know what a hydrogel is, it's actually a gel that can absorb a lot of water, sometimes over 99% of water. So I believe that all of you have had jello and maybe even like jello. So if you think, you know, jello has it's watery a little bit, right? It has this pushy hydrogel. Well, gel is technically a hydrogel. And in fact, we use gelatin as a biomaterial in tissue engineering. When I say tissue engineering, what I really mean is that we are trying to replicate what happens inside your body or that should replicate portions of your body like organs or skin or different tissues. And we try to make those in the lab. To do that, we use our materials, we use hydrogels. In those hydrogels, we put cells and we also give them nutrients and oxygen that they need to survive so we can build those mini tissues in the lab. Those then we can use to put in patients or we can use them as drug screening platforms or many other actually applications. And when I say drug delivery, what I mean is that we can use the hydrogels as sustained delivery devices. Again, when you take a pill, most of you have probably taken a pill, maybe because you had a headache, uh, you know, you pop it in your mouth, right? Most of the pills we take orally. However, some pills just don't work this way, or maybe if you take them orally, they, they really can't get to where they need to go to have an effect. For those types of drugs, for those drugs, right, with the, or therapeutics, we can put them inside of our material and then inject them potentially where they are needed and so that the material will slowly over time release this drug so it can have its therapeutic effect. So, but again, our lab is focused on materials and I will show you now today what we have. And so um, these are called tissue culture food and maybe um, I'll have a student in a minute who will show us how tissue culture foods are used. Um, so here we have something which is called a fume food. In something like a fume food, it's also a chemical food. This is where we do some of our organic synthesis. We have another food as well. It's a different lab, so I don't, I don't have time to show it to you. But we also make our own materials. So here we have a student, um, and so this is Janavi. So Janavi is actually an undergraduate student who is counting in the lab. So if you come to campus, you come for a school, you'll have this opportunity to do research in a, in a real lab, right? Um, so Janavi was today, she's trying to make some hydrogels. So she's using this balance to measure the exact amount of powder so that she can make her hydrogel. And this is actually where you see most of our <laughs> bottles of powder. So in a minute. So here we have another student. So this is Sam. So Sam is also making hydrogel. He is working on the drug delivery project. Uh, so what he does, he puts drugs in his hydrogel and he is looking at how the hydrogel release the drug and he doesn't get released from that. So he uses a lot of those microfuge tubes where he collects his release fraction. So currently he's just processing some of his samples. But this is his workspace. 
So <clears throat> if I go further in the lab, so here you can see um, this is called a UV oven. So this is where we cross-link or we make some of our hydrogels. We make them basically by baking them, so to speak, under a UV. Again, I mentioned here those are our tissue culture foods where we do all of our cell work. So something that um, maybe you can see, they have a screen that protects the tissue culture food from the environment. So when you work with human cells, we want to keep the environment very clean because everything in the air, you know, there is bacteria, there's particulates always in the air around you. You know, you're also full of bacteria, right? We do not this bacteria in our cells. We do not want it because bacteria actually takes over the culture media and kills the cells. So that's actually why every time we do cell work, we do the work in these tissue culture foods which is a clean environment so we can protect the cells from the harmful bacteria. When we want to simply look at the cells to see how they're doing, um, we use a very simple microscope. So maybe many of you have used this one in your classrooms in high school. Uh, this is just a very simple inverted microscope, um, but it allows us to very quickly check the state of the cell. So if you see this box right here, this is called an incubator. So an incubator is where we keep our cells in a humidified environment with CO2 to keep the pH of the media at the, you know, at the 7.4, which is like what you also have in your body. And we also keep it at the temperature of 37, which is also the temperature of your body. So the cells need very much similar conditions to what you have in your body to survive. And if I open the incubator right now, you can basically see all of our cells inside. They're behind the glass. I'll show you some of the cells with whom um, a student is working with them. So I'll show you some of them. But this is here. You can see that we have the various levels and we have different experiments going on currently. So if I keep going, and I hope it's not too. <laughs> The small screen, but I'll show you now some of the other equipment in the lab. So right here, this is not currently being used, but this is kind of a high content imager. So this machine right here allows us to, it's kind of like a microscope, allows us to image the cell, uh, but it does so in a high content or high throughput manner. What that means is that you know when you take a picture for example with your phone right you can really take one picture maybe every five seconds maybe every 10 seconds it's the same with the microscope when you take pictures it takes us some time well you can imagine if you need to take 96 pictures which is typical for an experiment for example that's going to take a lot a lot of time what this machine does it takes a picture every uh, part of a second so that it can image 90, it can take 96 images in about two minutes. So it really saves us time. It also spares the cells. We use this typically to image cells. The cells don't like to be out of the incubator. They like to be comfortable. They like to be at 37 degrees, pH 7.4, and humidified environment. So every time we take them out, we really have to be very cautious and keep them outside for a very long time and put them back where they like. Here, I have another student, A, who is working on mechanical testing of materials. And so, as you can see here, A is working on an instrument called a rheometer. So, what the rheometer does, it measures the mechanical properties of our hydrogels, which basically means it can tell us how soft or stiff a material is. I mean, you can get a sense of that even just by touching. So, for example, if you touch a jello, right, you can feel that it's very soft. But it's also better if you know the exact stiffness or softness of the material. It's also very important for us. And if you think about your body, all of the different tissues in your body would have different stiffness. For example, 
the softest tissue in your body is the brain. <laughs> the, 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 the gray matter of the brain is going to be the softest tissue in your body. But then something like tendons or bones are going to be the stiffest. And you know, you have to put numbers. The numbers that you put to these mechanical parameters are typically called Young's modulus or just elastic modulus. And so this is, I will show you right now how the material is working. So basically that is called a parallel plate geometry. What the instrument does, it basically squeezes the hydrogel between two plates. And then it starts rotating the top plate at a very high frequency. And when it rotates that top plate, it's actually looking at how much displacement there is in the hydrogel. So how much it can really distort that hydrogel. The more it can distort it, the more displacement there is, the softer the material is, right? You can imagine if it's something like really, really hard tissue, you can't just displace it by simply rotating something on top. If it's something soft, you can. Okay, so that's actually that's how we get measurements with this particular instrument and we do so without really damaging the material. Because you can imagine something soft as jello, you can't simply pull it or press it to get much mechanical properties because it breaks very easy. So this particular machine is really good for hydrogel because they are usually very soft and they break easily. So we can't manipulate them very harshly. So area right now here, um, well, actually in a minute, I will show you exactly what parameters she's setting because she's setting the instrument right now. But I can tell in a minute like what kind of data you get from this instrument. And meanwhile, I will show you our dark room. So when we image the cells, we very often need to stain them. And if you have seen any pictures of cells, maybe, I don't know, in a magazine or on the web, typically they're very beautifully colored, right? <laughs> they have blue and green and red and purple. All those are typically dyes that we stain our cells with, and we can stain different parts of the cell, like, for example, the nucleus of the cell, or the cell membrane, or the cell cytoplasm, or different things inside the cell cytoplasm. And that shows us how the cells are doing and what kind of shape they're basically taking upon interaction with our materials. So here I have Joey in our bathroom. You can see this room has black walls and black ceiling because we want to minimize all ambient light when you're looking at those fluorescent cells. All of that ambient light will um, actually interfere with the fluorescence. So this is a little bit more sophisticated microscope that you see here, not as simple as the one I showed earlier, because this microscope can take pictures, can take images, it's also more powerful, um, it can take fluorescence images and so forth. So it's a little bit, it's actually quite more powerful than the one I showed you earlier. Right here in front, we have some uh, lab ducts, and those we, we typically use if we want to have a set up, if we want to really set up both into, into our microscope. And this we might do, for example, if we want to run media or something over the cells as we are imaging them. And so this is, um, there you go. So this is a picture. And I don't know how well you can see it on the screen, but this is picture of cells that are currently um, grown in the lab. Hmm. You know, things look better <laughs> in real life. I hope you can see the pictures in the cells in here. But this is what it looks like. <laughs> Amy, do you see? Did you see anything? Yeah, yeah, I could see it pretty well with the different structures and okay. we can see the outlines, yeah. It's all, yes, I mean, those are not the fluorescent cells. Those are just like cells which are just like called a phase contrast image. So they're fluorescent. It simply shows the outlines of the cell exactly, exactly as you said. And um, right. okay. there you go. Okay. Well, so now Joey will be putting the cells back in the incubator because as I told you earlier, they don't like to be outside of the incubator. So that is it. You're good. Okay, well, I want to say a huge thank you, Dr. Zisiak, and to all of the students in your lab today that showed us what, what they're doing 
Um, I think it's just so fascinating that we still have so much to learn in the medical field and then combining um, what we what we know in medicine with engineering and creating solutions for for health problems, right? Yes, that's exactly what we do. Awesome. Well, well thank, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Zisiak. I'm going to send you back to this side. All right. Well, again, a huge thank you to all of our faculty and our current students who were in those labs for those um, for those quick tours that we had across the mechanical engineering, the civil engineering, and the biomedical engineering fields. Um, uh, so next up, we have we have a, a challenge for for you at home to do in the next week or so um, to get some hands on time. So here at Parks College, typically when we when we host students in person, um, we we like to have hands on activities um, that that get you thinking. They are impromptu challenges. Um, with a given set of materials and students are encouraged to think creatively and collaboratively to come up with an out of the box solution for a given problem. So through each of these lab visits, we heard that um, there were, uh, you know, some needs being met and then our engineers um, get to work on utilizing the resources available to them to come up with a solution. So we would like you to try that at home. Um, and since we can't be physically in the space today, the same physical space today, um, we're, we're gonna challenge you to use the household items uh, or classroom items that you might have available to complete one of these innovation challenges and submit a photo or video of your final design to us. And we will be selecting three winners of the challenge who will win Starbucks gift cards. So do it for the experience, but also um, do it for an extra Starbucks gift card. <laughs> uh, hold on one second, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so this is the challenge sheet uh, and your challenge for over the next week uh, when you have time uh, is about sustainable solutions. So you're gonna find some items around your house that you would typically discard or recycle. So used items that have already served their initial purpose, um, something like used pens, um, old newspapers or magazines, empty water bottles. These are just a few examples of the materials that you could use. And uh, when you gather those items of whatever you have on hand, uh, however many items and in whatever combination, construct a platform for your laptop, Chromebook, phone, or tablet to rest on when you're zooming so that you can keep your screen at eye level. So we're going to simulate eye to eye contact as best as we can <laughs> through this challenge. So the, plat the platform that you build must hold the weight of your device. It must keep the device level and it must look, look attractive. So the more creatively you use your discarded items that you find for your design, the better. So after this webinar concludes in the next day or so, we will email out this PDF document of the challenge and it will have all the information that you need to successfully complete the challenge. It also includes the information as you'll see on how to submit a video or photo of your innovation to our judges. That email will be, uh, so the email that we sent out will be sent to all of our registered participants. If you're not a registered participant of Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day at SLU 2021, uh, just go ahead and send us an email at parksevents at slu.edu and we'll get this information to you. Uh, pretty much anyone who would like to participate um, who is a middle school or high school age student is eligible. So we really can't wait to see what designs you will create from your repurposed items. Uh, we are now going to take a brief break. So go ahead and stretch your legs, hit the restroom, grab something to drink, and we will return in five minutes at 11 a.m. for our current engineering student panel. So I will see you then. Thanks.
right, welcome back everyone. Uh, we are now going to move to our current engineering student panel. So I will bring in these students now. All right, and I think we have one more who will join us. Um, here she comes. All right, everyone feel free to turn on your cameras. Awesome. All right, so I will I will be asking each of these uh, women to um, introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, so I'm going to start off um, our panel today with a few pre written questions to get things rolling, and then we will open it up for audience questions. So if you are um, viewing through zoom, feel free to submit submit a question through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you're on YouTube live today, go ahead and uh, put any questions in the comments and I will monitor both throughout uh, to make things easier today um, amongst our panelists. How about we answer questions beginning with Emma, then Grace, then Reagan, then Allie. All right. So to begin, um, would each of you please introduce yourselves? Uh, tell us where you're from, um, your year in school, um, what you study, what extracurriculars you're involved in, just kind of that general overview to start us off. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Emma Anderson. I am a senior at SLU, so this is my fourth year, and I am studying biomedical engineering. So I'm actually currently at work right now. I am doing a co-op at BioMiru as an integration engineer, um, and that's been a really interesting experience. I've been doing that for about a month. But uh, other than being really busy working, I um, am involved in a bunch of different clubs on campus. Um, I'm currently the president of the Society of Women Engineers, and I'm also involved in Tau Beta Pi, which is the Engineering Honor Society, as well as the Association for Parks College Students. So I help plan events for Parks College. Um, but yeah, I really love my major and, you know, I'm very passionate about engineering and specifically for biomedical, I'd really love to help people. Um, and that's why I'm studying what I am studying. So yeah, any questions that you have about any of those things like working, being in college, being BME, I would be happy to answer. Hi, so my name is Grace Almgren. Um, I'm from Bettendorf, Iowa. I'm a freshman this year. Um, I'm also st studying biomedical engineering as well as mathematics. Um, and I've done some, done some uh, involvement with uh, Society of Women Engineering. I've gone to some of those meetings. Um, I'm also involved in my learning community, um, which is basically a place where I live with a group of people who are similar to me on campus in the dorms. Um, and so I'm involved kind of with helping plan some of the activities that we do as learning communities. Um, I also do some tutoring through Overground Railroad, and then I'm in the choir as well. And like Emma said, if you guys have any questions about any of those, about engineering, um, about just in general coming into college, um, I just, <laughs> I'm a freshman, so I just went through that whole process. So please feel free to ask any questions that you have. Okay, hello, I'm Reagan Ansball. I'm from Austin, Texas, and I am a junior studying mechanical engineering. And on campus, I'm involved with Society of Women Engineers. And then also, like Emma too, I'm a part of the Association of Parks College Students. And so, yeah, that's basically it for me. Hi, I'm Allie. I'm from Mount Prospect, which is a small suburb of Chicago. I'm also studying biomedical engineering, but I'm actually pre-law. So if you have any questions about being pre-law as an engineer, I'm happy to answer them. As far as what I'm involved in on campus, I'm involved in the Society of Women for Engineers. I'm part of Mock Trial and then Parks Racing as well, which is kind of a bunch of engineers come together and we design a race car. So those are kind of the big three. Thank you. Yes, Parks Racing is really neat, um, especially when they get everything construction and there's a race car sitting in the lab. Um, okay, uh, well, our next question is, can we talk a little bit about your, your career goals and why um, you chose engineering as your career path? And also, if you want to expand on, um, you know, your plans or goals in your career, um, you could do that too. 
Okay, so I'll get us started then. Also, I turn off my video because I'm eating lunch right now. So just forgive me if I hop off and on. So um, like I mentioned earlier, I was drawn to biomedical engineering specifically because, you know, I thought maybe I wanted to be pre-med, but I always really loved math and science. And biomedical engineering seemed like a really great way for me to combine my engineering interests with my medical field interests. Um, and that ended up working out really well for me. I think it's it's a very unique major where we learn a lot about a lot of different things. So we learn about electrical, we learn about mechanical. We don't really learn about civil or aerospace, but we basically learn about every a little bit about everything, which is really gives you a unique perspective. So with that, um, I am hoping to work for a medical device company. So Working at BioMiru has been a really awesome opportunity for me to work on big medical devices that go in hospitals and are saving people's lives every day. Um, so that's been really fulfilling for me. And I would love to continue my journey with medical device companies and more in like a quality engineering role like I'm doing now where I get to work with the instruments in the product development phase and test them to see what, what's working with them, what do we need to change and um, get that instrument to the best quality it can be for the customers. Yeah, so um, coming into SLU, I applied undecided. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. Um, and then I went to a information session about biomedical engineering, just because I thought that would kind of encapsulate my interests and I really liked it. Um, and so I switched my major to that and I'm on that track now and I really enjoy it. Um, I find that a lot of engineering is, you know, math and problem solving. And that's something that I've been doing like my whole life. I love problems. I love math equations, all of that stuff. But I also like to be with people. And so then that biomedical engineering kind of adds that people component to the, the hardcore math and science. Um, and I really, really love that. Um, I'm right now kind of my career goals, um, not entirely sure just yet as I am just a freshman, but I do love uh, the brain and kind of learning about how that works. And so kind of some sort of um, application of maybe the biomedical, the technical side, then applying it to the brain and seeing like, for example, um, brain computer interfacing that really interests me. So I'll continue to explore and then kind of go from there. Okay, so I did uh, engineering because I really, I enjoy obviously, <laughs> like Grace, I love problem solving as well. And I wanted to be in a field where you were always generating and like creating because I'm a very creative person. So I wanted to make sure that I was in something that was always like evolving. And it was, engineering is always at the forefront of any development and so important to the world. So that's why I love engineering. And then I did mechanical because it's more like hands-on and it's very general. So there's a lot of space for me to play within that field. And my career goals for it is I would love to do like system management, like more on the industrial side of it, because I like working with people and I like making things more efficient and just making sure everything runs smoothly. And then also maybe design because I do like noticing things wrong and just immediately being able to kind of fix it or innovate from that. So kind of a little bit what everyone else said, I love problem solving. Actually, weird thing, my mom in like seventh grade was like, you should be a biomedical engineer. And I didn't know what that mean, like meant at the time. And I was like, okay. And then I never changed it. So I just kind of like, as I went through high school, I saw how my skill set was really applicable to being an engineer. And I especially love math and science and going into BME. I thought it was very interesting because I think as Emma said, you get to combine kind of more of like the biology and like the human body interests with your design interests as well. And then the pre-law actually got added freshman year. I realized that I wanted to be on the forefront of emerging technologies and not, I still love designing, but I wanted to be that one person who like kept seeing the emerging technologies. And so being a patent lawyer, you get to be on that forefront and you're that person that needs to communicate the scientists, the scientific talk with the scientists. And then you need to be able to talk like professional and law with the different lawyers. And I loved being that 
kind of bridge between the scientists and then the big companies that are using the programs and the design. So yeah, hopefully we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you all. Yes, um, Ali and Emma, you know, both of you have a, a more specific of kind of which direction you're heading in and you've tailored your education and your internships to, to that end goal. And then um, Grace and Reagan, I love how, you know, your, your education is still allowing you to go in whatever direction you end up with. So you have such a strong foundation with an engineering education. Um, so I, I think you guys mostly addressed what, what you love about engineering. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more specifically about your experience as a student at Parks and what are some aspects of undertaking an engineering degree that, that you uh, didn't expect before arriving in the program? That's kind of a hard question. So, um... I'm going to go for a little bit of a different perspective or, you know, talk about something that's made a big difference in my college career. And one of those things was studying abroad. So I was able to study abroad my second semester of sophomore year um, because St. Louis University has a sister campus in Madrid, Spain. And that was an absolutely incredible experience to be able to not only study from a different country, but study engineering from a different country, which you would think is really scary, but it's not. So um, that was a really incredible opportunity. And that was one of the reasons that I chose to come to SLU. But um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it as a student here. It definitely is challenging and college really pushes you. And But in ways it's also easier because you have a lot of free time, but then if you don't manage your free time, it can be really difficult. So there's just a lot of, you know, there's a big learning curve to starting college, but it's really, it's really great. And as long as you're motivated and you can stay on top of what you're supposed to be doing, then it's very manageable. And it's, it's really cool to say, you know, like, oh yeah, I'm a woman and I'm studying engineering. Like it's, there's just no question. I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. So, yeah. So, kind of piggybacking um, off of Emma there, I, <laughs> I applying to colleges. I knew that I wanted to study abroad. Um, I, that was like a big thing for me. Um, and it is not very. Um, there are not many universities that offer the opportunity for engineers to study abroad and SLU is one of those places and that was just so incredibly appealing to me and so I'm super excited to be able to study abroad. I'm going to go um, the spring of my sophomore year um, and I think that's just something that really did surprise me about the SLU program but also um, made it a really wonderful um, I, like an attractive part about SLU. Um, but also then just kind of the whole engineering path and curriculum in general, I think is just um, a lot of fun uh, looking at all the classes that I'm so excited to take um, in, in the upcoming years um, and kind of go on this journey also with a really large community of other engineers. SLU is really awesome about providing a really um, supportive community, you know, there are engineering learning communities and there are, you know, organizations like Society of Women in Engineering and all of these things to help support engineers. And that's, I think, super duper fun um, and exciting about SLU. Okay, so um, my experience with parks. So actually I went in as a freshman in electrical engineering. And so I kind of, I got three semesters in and actually it was when bringing up study abroad again, is I was abroad during the fall um, of 2019. So I was very lucky. Um, I just missed everything with the pandemic, which was great. And also fall is a great time to go. The weather is better and there's less people. So like if you also have that option as well, don't forget about it. So for me, I kind of realized electrical wasn't the best fit. And I was really worried because I was like, is it going to be really hard for me to switch my major? And it wasn't very hard at all. Um, it was like a very simple thing. I've known a couple people that have switched within engineering. And so because things in the beginning, like really run together and you have a lot of similar core, like engineering classes, especially if you, if you are only three semesters in. So if you are not totally sure exactly which engineer you're doing, want to do, 
you take those intro classes and you kind of maybe see which one fits the best for you. And so that way, you know, like it's not going to be super permanent and you have a little bit more flexibility, which I would, I appreciate it at Park. So if you want to worry about that. And yeah, so then I just transferred mechanical, had my semester, had engineering design. I was like, yeah, this is what I wanted in engineering. And I kind of realized that. So if you're not exactly sure, cause it's kind of hard to visualize what engineering is. So like taking those classes, it really gives you a better idea and it was a good time. <laughs> so here you go. So I'm going to take a different perspective because I was supposed to go abroad this semester and um, I decided not to. So it's very sad, but it's okay. That was one of the things that drew me to SLU as well. But as far as parks, I love especially how like passionate a lot of the professors are. Freshman year, you, I took a lot of gen eds, a lot of like gen chem, gen bio. And when you're in a classroom of, gosh, like 100 students, you don't really get to know the professor that well. They're not super passionate about what they're teaching because it's not like their focus. And going into sophomore year where I was in kind of classes with just BMEs, it was really nice to see the professors were excited about what they were talking about because it's something they're doing research in and they're very knowledgeable about it. So if you go up and you want to talk to them about their research, they're always so happy to talk about their research, which I think is so cool. So that's been really nice kind of getting that one on one with professors and understanding that they're just as passionate about what you're studying as like you are. So that's been pretty cool. I think that's just great advice all around for whatever um, you know college program anyone is in is talk to your professors. They are people and they get excited about their work and they want you to be enthused as well. Uh, well, that sounds great. Thank you guys. Um, I just wanna remind anybody who is viewing, go ahead and submit any questions you have for um, our current students in that Q&A feature in Zoom or in the comment section if you're on YouTube. Um, for my next question for you guys, um, so I was a high school student who um, wasn't the best at math. And what would what kind of advice or um, well, what advice? And then how would you recommend that high school students prepare now if they think that engineering might be a career um, or or at least a college education that they want to pursue? Okay, so. Before I answer that question, Allie just reminded me of another thing that I wanted to say that's really good about SLU. <laughs> so, and that is, it's kind of going off of like the professor thing. There are so many opportunities for you to get involved in research here because it's a smaller school. Like, and I was really fortunate because I was able to get involved in a lab my freshman year, which is like, if you go to a big school, that's just not an option. It's just not possible. But I was able to do that. And funnily enough, I was like, I hate this. I don't want to do this. You know, I don't want to do orthopedic bioengineering. But if I didn't get in the lab, then I wouldn't have known that I didn't want to do that. So, and that's something that's really important. And that kind of just transitions right into Amy's question, which is like, you know, what if I don't feel like I'm the best at math or like I don't know about engineering? And what I would say is a good option for you is look into opportunities to learn more about engineering. Like when I was in high school, I got involved in my like Society of Women Engineers Club that we had. And what they actually did was they brought in college students from the area and we got to do little like experiments and labs and stuff. And it was really, really fun, kind of awakened that design spark that I had in me or whatever whatever you want to call it. So that was something that's really cool. And also I've like read a few articles about this, which is like, it's just, I just feel like I need to mention it now. If you feel like you're not the best at math, sometimes that's a byproduct of like, just not having maybe the best instruction that works for you or being on like a lower level than the rest of your peers. And if you work to improve your skills in those topics outside of school, you can really get a lot better in those areas. And then that by, you know, by default, it makes you feel a lot better about your abilities to do math and do science. And I think it was actually mentioned in an interview that I listened to with the founder of Khan Academy. 
So he knows what he's talking about. So that's something that I would recommend if you are kind of feeling that way. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say. Yeah, so obviously I am a uh, BME and uh, math double major. So I really love math um, and I've been doing some tutoring with, of um, doing some math tutoring like throughout high school for high school students. Um, and basically I would just say, don't give up on math yet. <laughs> you still have time to learn and grow in your math skills. And kind of like Emma said, usually it kind of boils down to um, the instruction of how you're given the math concepts. So honestly, if you are really, if you love this engineering, but the math is just really making you nervous, there are so many resources to help you. Um, Khan Academy is an amazing free resource. Um, I would highly, highly recommend. They just have practice problems. You can kind of test it out. Um, I might also suggest just doing some problem solving. Um, I know my family, we have this little puzzle a day um, thing. And so every morning, I one of the first things I do when I get up is I do a puzzle. And I think that that just kind of like exercises that problem solving part of your brain uh, that maybe not always is really hardcore math and formulas. Um, but really just don't give up on math yet. I promise it will be okay. And there are so many resources um, to help you out. Um, and in regards to in high school, um, I, did um so i would kind of i guess had a little bit more of an untraditional route and i did a lot of music and theater so a lot more to the creative arts in high school um and then i kind of fell in love with engineering and college um, and i think that that part kind of exercised my creative side to allow me to be able to innovate and learn about you know how how to think about these problems and how to um, come up with creative solutions because that's what theater is it's having you know, a whole bunch of creative ideas together. Um, but I would suggest, you know, making sure to exercise that creative side while also then getting involved in whatever engineering um, things you have at your high school, just kind of dipping your toes in everything to get exposure and see what you like, see what fits and see what doesn't fit because that's just as important as what, what you do like. Okay, so my advice, if you're a high school student or um, someone really thinking about engineering is to take as many advanced courses as you can for the reason that I think that you'd be like, well, I'm not going to use American history with engineering. Well, that's correct. However, the thing is, is that why taking a lot of these art classes, because generally you're probably really smart, you kind of build up like adjustment to like a harder workload. And so you kind of have an easier transition into college because I knew a lot of people I took every single AP class that my school offered, just because like, for me, I, I love a bunch of different things. So I really did love American history. And I was good at it and whatever. And some of those and those classes were not that bad, like compared to like, calculus, if that makes sense. So sometimes with their uh, workload. But for me, like my first semester, I felt like, oh, okay, I took Calc 1 again, I took chemistry again, but I already had those AP. So my GPA was good. I felt like a better adjustment because I've already had those classes before. It was kind of more familiar for me. And so that's what I really liked as well as like when you, um, well, right now with tests and stuff is like, just make sure like when you study, like if you take the ACT or stuff, because I know in the pandemic, it's a little different, but if you're a younger generation, um, just make sure like you study for those tasks because like the ACT does help you. I know like a lot of schools have a requirement for like engineering where you have to get like a 28 on math. So just make sure you take some time out of your day because I know I was one of those people I put off like studying, didn't want to study for those tests. And so that way it'll help you with scholarships. And even though it's like seems annoying, it just kind of helps you progress and like makes it easier for your application. So that way you don't have to worry about it senior year, because trust me, the last thing you want to do is try to cram in and get your ACT score perfect right before you apply. So just kind of think about that early. That makes sense. Or SAT, but generally engineers do better on the ACT. So I went to a private high school, so there weren't like that many engineering programs. I know a lot of public high schools had like engineers without borders and we did not. The ha like closest I could get to engineering was taking AP physics. So I would recommend if you go to like a private school or your, your school doesn't have that many engineering opportunities, trying to find some 
outside. I went to a lot of summer camps that I don't know. Oh my gosh. I went to a lot of summer camps that kind of helped help me grow that ability to troubleshoot and like and gave me design projects very similar to kind of what I ended up doing in college. But I would also say develop good study habits early. You don't have to be good at the class. You just have to know how to study for it. So there have been classes where I haven't picked stuff up or there have been classes where I've understood one aspect of it and my friends understood the other and we've come together and we've studied it together. So I would just say having good study habits early and understanding how you study best is really going to help you in college, even if you're you're not good at math. You don't have to be good at math to be an engineer. You just have to understand it. And I believe that there's a difference. So as Grace said, don't give up on it. I believe in everyone. I love that. Um, all of your words of wisdom were great. I'm going to call back to MS really quick and just uh, a uh, plug that Parks College is more than happy to do virtual lab visits or guest speakers for any classes that are viewing today. So if you are a teacher or an administrator, please get in touch with us. Um, we would, we, our faculty and our current students would love to um, schedule a time to virtually meet with your class now. And then in the future, we would love for you to come visit us uh, when it's safe to do so. All right, panelists, so we got, uh, a really fun question. Anyone can feel free to answer this one. Um, if you didn't go into engineering, what would you major in? Um, I can go for this one. I'm also, I know I see the second question and I have to hop off right at 1130. So I'm actually going to answer both questions. So I've always said to other people, if I wasn't BME, then I would be mechanical engineering. So this is a tricky question because it's okay, it's not engineering anymore. And in that case, I'd probably go for like a business administration degree or it's, there's a running joke that BME stands for business majors eventually. So, and I actually really like that business side. I've taken some marketing classes, some econ classes, some management classes, and all of that is really interesting to me. And business administration is a very overarching major that touches on all of those things. So that's probably what I would do. And I saw that the second question is like, how can you participate in and balance things like choir and theater in college while taking classes like that are science related? And, you know, I am involved in organizations outside of parks and that are not science related. Like I'm in the leadership honor society and stuff like that. And I really love choir and theater. And I'm frankly disappointed in myself that I haven't gotten involved in those things, but I have got, you know, done volunteer opportunities and stuff like that, which is not science related. So, and as far as that would go, I would just say having something other than your major is very important in college because it can be exhausting to only be thinking about science or like one topic all day, every day. So having that balance is actually really important and making time for yourself to do other things that you care about is like just how you stay healthy, both mentally and physically even. So yeah, that's something that I would not be scared to pursue if that's something that you care about. Yeah, um, for me, I think I would probably go into some, if I was not engineering, um, I would probably go into teaching, specifically math teaching. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'd be in the high school level or, or like or be a professor. And that's still a real possibility for me. I don't quite know just yet, um, but that's probably where I would lead. Um, and then how can I, how can you participate and balance things like choir and theater while also taking science classes? Um, well, first of all, it is very possible. You can totally do it. And I would recommend, like, like Emma said, that you branch out of your major and that you don't limit yourself that just because I'm an engineering student, I can only do things engineering. That's so not true. Um, what makes you a unique person and well-rounded is that you branch out and do other things. That you take leadership opportunities, that you uh, participate in theater and choir. And if you have a passion for it, you will make it work. Um, just so long as you know you're you're managing your time well. So I find you know to do lists really help planning things out, knowing your deadlines. Um, college is very different than high school in that you're given all of your assignments. Basically, here's kind of what we're gonna do throughout the whole year go. <laughs> um, and so you can't possibly have it all done at every moment. But managing your time, budgeting, you know, taking this hour for yourself, these, uh, you know two hours for choir, these few hours for um, for taking care or for going to the theater practice. If you budget your time well, um, 
then it is entirely possible for you to do it. And there are many, if you're, you know, if you're going, oh my gosh, I just have no idea how to do that. There are so many resources at SLU that can help you. Uh, the Student Success Center, your RAs, uh, peer mentors can help you out as well if you're in the learning community. So there are just so many people out there who want to help you with these as well. Okay, so if I wasn't going to be an engineer, without limitations, I'd probably say I would like to go to film school because I really do like filmmaking and I, I'm like the person that sees every single movie and analyzes it all and I'll know everything with uh, directors and actors and all this stuff and it's very fascinating to me. Um, but also, it's kind of hard. I probably would end up doing something in business administration. But in terms of like doing something that's like more creative or something outside of engineering while you're in this degree, I would say like sometimes it is hard to have that balance because it is a lot of work. But what I do sometimes I would go into Simon Rock and there's empty studios and I used to do ballet. So I just do um, ballet for a little bit. I do some <laughs> improv and whatever, kind of get out some of the stress and my reliever is dance. And so also another thing is, is that my mentor, so I have a mentor that was at Boeing. Um, she was a figure skater. So she actually did like Disney on ice and she works at Boeing now, but she's also an ice skating instructor. So I think it's also like important to know, like when you graduate and in your, in your engineering career, because like the hours are more set, <laughs> why I kind of chose engineering is like, it allows you to do some of those creative things on the side. And so also because like, you have maybe a more stable job and a good income. It allows you to have more money so you can spend more on those hobbies. Or even if like you're in development and you're like, oh, I want to take a dance class for the first time at 24. Like you can like start doing those hobbies. And so that's kind of how I do my creative balance with engineering right now. But yeah, that's it. So you can definitely do it, but you just have to be kind of careful about it. I'll keep my answer short because I know we're running out of time. But um, the first question, if I wasn't engineering, I'd probably be business. I know it's a basic one. I'd like to say something cool like theater, but I am not a theater major in no way, shape or form. Um, as far as balancing engineering and other extracurriculars, being pre-law, I have a lot of stuff that I'm involved in kind of outside of engineering. And I think if you're really passionate about something, you'll make time for it. And it, it doesn't seem like a chore. So I've also developed really good time management skills in college, and I think that's really important as well. So it's a combination of passion and time management that gets me through the long hours of working in engineering and then hopping on a Zoom for a mock trial. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you, all four of you. Um, unfortunately, we are just out of time for this session, but a huge thanks to Grace, Emma, Allie, and Reagan. Um, for, for taking time out of your day to be part of this panel and for answering our questions. Um, I definitely learned a lot and I hope our, our attendees enjoyed meeting you. All right, so uh, in just a moment, I'm going to have the four of you move back over and I will pull our keynote speaker over. All right, I think we've got some movement. Here we go, awesome. All right, so our our next in our final session of today is our keynote address. Um, we are really, really lucky to have graduate student Crystal Bell here to present. Um, you might recognize her name uh, because Dr. Cox mentioned her back in the, um, the visit to our Water Institute. We saw your workstation, Crystal. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so uh, Crystal is originally from Milwaukee. She graduated in 2020 with her undergraduate degree in civil engineering, and she's currently pursuing a master's in civil engineering, and she'll graduate this May from that program. During her time at SLU, she's been involved in numerous extracurricular activities, including a group called Billikens for Clean Water, and I believe she'll be telling you more about her experiences and leadership with that organization. Crystal is an accomplished student, an active member of her community, and an exceptional role model. We are just so excited to hear from her now. So please, uh, from wherever you are, welcome Crystal with a quiet round of applause. <laughs> Crystal, you can take it from here. 
Thank you so much, Amy. I appreciate you for having me here today. Um, and for everyone else, I hope you've had a really good morning. Um, I know you've had some tours and a great panels. So um, thank you for being here. Um, I know that we're all, we've all arrived here for various, through various avenues, right? So, um, some of you are super excited to pursue an engineering career and props to you. You have a lot of work and a ton of fun ahead of you, but maybe you're just happy to escape a day of academics and that's totally okay. We all need a moment to take a breather, but I hope you learned something that you didn't know and feel energized for uh, your radiant next steps. And maybe some of you are feeling a little like I did in high school. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. I'm a child. How am I supposed to pick something to do for the rest of my life? I need to do something good. I wanna do something I love. How do I begin? Where do I begin? Is engineering hard? I had all the questions and I wonder if some of you are feeling that way too. So whether it's your choice to be here or if someone decided for you, it is now up to you on how you wanna treat the rest of today. I'm going to ask you to hang with me. I'm going to start my story all the way from the beginning in hopes that maybe some of you can relate or find some clarity. So now I have studied, graduated and practiced some engineering. So it's easy for me to say, but in hindsight, I was destined to become an engineer. I was a natural born problem solver without even realizing it. I'm sure many of you are too. I was a fifth grade peer mediator for playground squabbles. I was a builder of Lincoln Logs farms with my dad. And I was the creator of a program in high school that brought students together to address some common issues in schools across Southeastern Wisconsin. I was also that annoying kid that asked my mom 100 questions until she uh, cut me off. Here's my mom and my dad, and they still like me. <laughs> Looking back, I was just a little engineer. I was gathering all the relevant information to optimize solutions to problems, whether that problem was not understanding the concept of time or running out of all the large Lincoln log pieces or just a disagreement on the playground. I was determined to make it work. I also loved mathematics and would beg my parents to practice multiplication tables with me. Now, whether that was because I loved math or because I just wanted to win the class competition, that is for you to decide. But mostly I loved helping people, whether it was a troubled friend in eighth grade or volunteering in a retirement home throughout high school. I realized that positively impacting people was a life goal. This was the ultimate problem, though. I loved being a nerd, a name I lovingly call my friends and myself but I wanted to be with people and fix things that truly mattered. Engineering never came to mind, right? The stereotype of an engineer is what? A man, glasses, staring at a computer, maybe an old school pocket protector, calculator. My interest in multiple career paths made, me, made selecting a potential career very challenging. I was lucky enough to have an amazing cousin, Sarah, who was an engineer, and we were able to talk about what engineering actually looks like. I realized engineers are just professional problem solvers with a slight affinity to math, maybe. And I had been practicing problem solver since a child. We all have. And I decided at that point that I was going to be a student of engineering. But to be honest, when I thought of engineering, I still thought about calculators, graph paper, all the equations. But when I got to SLU, I was in for a big surprise. I was shocked by how hands-on my engineering classes were. And I realized that engineering is not just solving word problems at a desk, but solving complex problems in the real world. SLU completely shattered my expectations and gave me a taste of what engineering is really like by tossing me into guided situations in the lab and in the community. So we're going to have this little thing that I'm calling advice cameos. Throughout our time together, whenever I say something that makes me think, hmm, I wish I would have known this sooner, or maybe even something that I'm still striving to live by, I'll present it as an advice cameo. So first advice cameo. Don't judge prematurely. Keep an open mind. Don't knock it till you try it. 
Many of my negative expectations of engineering have been shattered by the reality I have lived here at SLU, and I could have missed so many insightful moments and an amazing career if I hadn't taken that leap of faith. Back to the regularly scheduled programming. SLU is home to many professional engineering organizations. I am a civil engineer, so I joined American Society of Civil Engineers. And this was my first real exposure to nerd stuff and I was all in. We were designing a concrete mix that had to float for a canoe race. Okay, let's, let's get things straight here. Concrete is heavy, very heavy. I think about, or please think about the shell of a swimming pool or bridge piers, you know, the columns that keep a bridge upright over a river. It's heavy. Concrete is not supposed to float. Nonetheless, we made it float. And um, we actually, I remember the senior had a whole spreadsheet of various calculations. It looks super intimidating, but how cool that we could put some numbers together in a specific manner, mix some ingredients and actually get a real product that is comparable to what we predicted. It was, it blew my mind. It was amazing. And Porte was one of the highlights of freshman year and the boat was actually raced at conference. <laughs> Freshman year, we also did things like water testing. Um, we made a super sturdy chair using just one piece of foam board. It could hold hundreds of pounds. It was really awesome. Given only sand, rocks, and clay, we made a 12 inch wide dam that actually held water back. We also used uh, traffic devices to analyze the wild intersection just over at Grand and Lindell. And when we got a little older and we were trusted a little more, we actually learned how to weld. We designed a steel beam. We fire torched it, also known as we welded it. And we got to load it with 13,000 pounds until it buckled and ultimately failed. The concrete bowling ball competition is by far the most fun. Check out this bowling alley. It's a bird's eye view. We erected it in about three to four hours, literally wood piece by wood piece, blackboard by blackboard, and it's in the rotunda. So everyone can walk by and see how crooked your bowling ball is rolling, which is great incentive to put in some quality work in this project. But we actually decorate them and we actually uh, score and which directly corresponds to our grade. But it's such a fun way to turn conceptual engineering into something we can actually see and do and understand. Some of you might actually have heard about Billiken beams, but while you are learning SEP 2000 software uh, and some of the fundamentals of structural engineering, we are learning alongside you uh, by strengthening these interpersonal skills and um, our communication. And Dr. Carroll also orders us pizza at the end of competition day, which makes the 8 a.m. start a little more worth it. As you can see, SLU Parks Engineering makes things fun while hammering in all of the necessary knowledge to become a, a great productive engineer. The easiest thing about transitioning from high school to college is that we still go on field trips. <laughs> My classes have gone to quarries to see rock blown up, Forest Park to estimate the weight of the King Lewis and horse statue. Uh, we have toured Lock and Dam 26, water and wastewater treatment plant tours to understand the complexity of how we get safe drinking water in our homes. And the best thing about SLU is that we aren't numbers to this college or to our professors. They know our names. They are super cool on top of being super smart. And one of our professors actually personalizes hats for every single freshman in civil engineering. It's really a fantastic program. This le leads me to uh, an advice cameo. So lean into your professors. They are normal people. You probably have something in common with them. They're really accomplished and impressive and uh, they're the start of your amazing future network. So I wanted to share with you one of my professors. This is actually my, my uh, master's thesis advisor and he's not so scary after getting to know him. Overall, I just feel super lucky to be um, able to have the opportunity to see and learn and experience the reality of engineering. And let me tell you, it is way more dynamic than I ever expected. Okay, so I have all of these awesome firsthand experiences, great professors, I'm learning a ton, but I'm still perplexed by how we come to the strange place we call college, 
where it's like a vacation from parents, but with even more chores. And not only do I have to choose what I'm gonna eat for dinner and where I'm gonna have coffee with a friend, but they want me to pick the career I'm gonna have for the next 50 years of my life. It floors me. I was getting some really cool hands-on engineering experiences in my classrooms, but I was searching for more. I wanted to tap into other skills and interests and I hadn't figured out how to incorporate my passion for social justice and leadership into engineering. So I had to make some tough decisions to figure out what my priorities were. Starting off college, I was also a full-time athlete. We worked out a ton. I won the wall sit competition my freshman year. I was traveling a bunch of weekends out of the semester, staying in hotels, catered food. We threw heavy things. It seems cool. And I'm really thankful for the experience and my uh, teammates, but it was keeping me from something really important. I wasn't able to explore some of my developing passions. For example, my first week of college, the very first week, I was dragged to this meeting for water advocacy called Billikens for Clean Water. Billikens for Clean Water is a super cool, dynamic, student-led organization that dips into advocacy, domestic, international, and campus awareness work. Funnily enough, going to what I thought was hmm, just a college club meeting, I thought it was kind of cool actually, uh, it ended up being the start of a journey that would change my life forever. From that meeting, I took away two big ideas. Number one, over two billion people do not have access to a safely managed drinking source. Safely managed is on premise, free of contamination, and available when needed. This is 2.2 billion people. Number two, engineers are a vital resource in solving that problem. So fast forward four years later, I have been to Blaze multiple times. I have lifelong friends because of it, found my thesis advisor that you just met, and I found an unstoppable passion that will continue to inspire me for years to come. I actually happened to land on the international side and in January of 2018, we decided that we just wanted to learn about the water situation in Belize. Each trip uh, was different in schedule and itinerary. It was transformative in the objectives uh, and perspectives that we gained and an absolute blast despite the minimal sleep. It was, it is, it was the early mornings, long drives on bumpy roads, hikes in the jungle, collecting, samples in community and analyzing them in the back of the pickup truck, eating the rice and beans on the Caribbean Sea, and constantly learning from our host family. Through all of the adventure and a lot of personal transformation, there is one thing that really stuck out to me. Communication, communication, communication. In the case of Belize, communication was vital in every aspect. Before we arrived for coordination in communities to listen, and learn with our in-community partner or in-country partners uh, to develop a trusting relationship and within our team for honest, open, transparent conversations that helped each of us grow. Looking back, we practice these skills in many of our classes, but sometimes it takes experiences outside of the classroom to realize that engineering is so much more than the numbers, codes, manuals. It is teamwork, leadership, and communication that make for a great engineer and make for an engaging and dynamic career. This brings us to an advice cameo. That Billikens for Clean Water meeting changed my life. Just go to the meeting, the event, the workshop, the speaker. When Buzz Aldrin comes, go. When Janet Mott comes, go. When you have the opportunity to opportunity to engage in dialogue, engage. Uh, when SLU is hiring someone for your college and offers a student session, go. You gain something that you can take with you on your life journey. And what's the worst thing that you can lose an hour of the day? And if you can afford that hour, just go for it. So even though I um, have fallen in love with Belize, our host family, the sessions we've learned, tropical weather, um, I would love to do it as a career someday. I knew I needed to explore some other options in engineering. So I turned to internships. 
the photos rolling now are actually from Madrid, Spain, where my first internship occurred because of an intersection of me being a little assertive and a slew Madrid faculty member being extremely generous. It was a two week civil engineering trip and it was breathtaking in that we got behind the scenes tour of one of the largest dams in Europe. We went to small towns, big cities. We dove into ancient and modern infrastructure of Spain. I thought it would be cool to stay for a little longer. So I reached out to Professor Javier to see if he knew of any internship opportunities. Uh, he said he'd look around. And a couple weeks later, he came back with an offer to work at uh, his small company. And of course, I graciously accepted. And I got to live and work like a real structural engineering adult in Madrid, Spain for um, four weeks after the class trip had ended. My second and third internships were with Alberici constructors and they were fantastic. Um, I was on the SSM SLU hospital project right down the road from SLU. I got to talk to tradespeople who were the ones bringing this structure to life and also the owner of the project who is approving the millions of dollars of cash flow. I worked beside large machinery, as you can see, uh, went on a few field trips, again, field trips, and I got to climb the 260 foot tower crane. You know, it's really special because some of my friends are now working and teaching in that hospital um, that opened in 2020. And so um, it made the project all the more special to me. And then the following summer, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, learning all about wastewater treatment with El Gracie. My final internship, was with a great company called Lockmiller. They were located in downtown St. Louis and Lockmiller does transportation, structural and water resources um, design across the region really. And I worked on projects, um, some in St. Louis, but also some in Indiana that mitigated uh, flooding, uh, sewage problems in people's homes and yards and pipe systems for an entire community. I thought it was going to be the stereotypical engineering job, what we've talked about, computer, calculator, numbers, but I actually went on a few field trips here too. There seems to be a trend. And I certainly had to communicate effectively with my team. That brings us to an advice cameo. Okay, keep your options open. This advice cameo uh, can be applied to many situations. Don't always be so sure you know exactly what you want to do. This can be applied to picking classes or internships or even in your career. Um, that's not to say don't pursue your passions. Please, please do. But it is important to pursue multiple paths, ideas, experiences while in college to gain a fuller understanding for when you actually leave college. And I guess this leads me to um, another cameo reach out when you think you might need help. There is value in figuring things out for yourself, of course, especially in engineering, when problem solving is the bread and butter of our industry. It's what makes us engineers. Um, but reaching out to bounce ideas, get opinions or advice is so, so healthy. Reach out to me after this if you are so inclined. Reach out to a current teacher uh, for help with college perspectives. Reach out to an engineer to pick their brain about how they got to where they are now. And reach out to a friend in hard times. And I will say that this is maybe a cameo in a cameo. <laughs> reach out to a friend in hard times. I'll say it again. Engineering school isn't easy. It's a lot of fun. And it's so much easier with good people. And these are my people that I leaned on through some of the toughest parts of my college career. And we dominated engineering school because of the constant support we provided each other. Now, I don't know exactly where I'll end up as an engineer, maybe advocating for drinking water access uh, on a national scale, or maybe it's going to be owning my own company or maybe something I currently cannot even imagine but I have gained so many skills and experiences that my career could launch in a number of directions. One thing I am absolutely certain about is that I want to continue mentoring people, young people specifically. I wanna keep solving problems, keep challenging myself to grow and stretch and change and achieve. And I challenge you to do the same. Find something you love 
whether it's engineering or otherwise, and give it all that you have got. Say yes, say yes to various opportunities. Give back whenever possible because we did not make it alone. We never do. Keep learning forever and seize the day. Thank you all for listening today, for staying strong this past year. Uh, you are capable of achieving so much in your lifetime. And as you are finding success in whatever you, it is that you set out to do, make sure that you reach out to help the next group of girls get there too. I wish you the best of luck in your future adventures. Crystal, thank you so much for this presentation, um, for your words of wisdom. And holy cow, you are so good at documenting <laughs> your past several years. Um, so thank you for sharing, sharing that with us. Um, in, our, in our last just couple moments, if anyone has any questions, please, uh, please submit those if you have a question for Crystal. Um, she graciously agreed to, um, to hang on for, for a couple minutes. Um, Crystal, I was wondering if I could ask you a question. Um, I know um, as, as, a, uh, as, a, as a woman in a, in a typically male-dominated field, um, engineering, aviation, um, business, role models play such a huge role in, in getting one person to, um, to where they want to be. Do you have any, um, experience with role models? You talked about the people that you lean on. Um, how did you go about finding yours? What advice do you have for someone who just doesn't know where to start? Absolutely. Um, I think it really goes back to the reach out, you know, it really just takes the first step. And a lot of these relationships happen organically in a way. If you are amazed by someone, tell them that, you know, uh, we all are influencing each other. And just to know that uh, someone is looking up to you, it, it breeds this relationship, this give take relationship. And as a young person, I've sometimes felt like, what am I going to give them? Like, they're going to take this time and talk to me and whatever else. But um, we are energized by each other really is what I've found out. Uh, and you're never too old to learn. And so if you have a mentor who um, is older in age than you, um, they are probably enjoying the relationship too. So um, I have some mentors in a lot of different areas of my life. Some have come around just by happenstance, a friend of a friend, or some are in engineering, um, but reach out and take that leap of faith. It's scary sending that email, um, get on the phone. That's a great way to do it. Um, keeping good relationships and old internships and jobs. Um, I actually just ended an internship and that conversation was really hard, but she was so happy for me and so supportive. And I would consider her um, one of my mentors, even if I'm not directly working with her. So reach out, be brave. Great, great advice. And thank you again for the phenomenal presentation. Um, you, you are definitely a role model um, for what a career in engineering can mean. Um, and I, I hope and think I speak for everyone when I say that we really did enjoy hearing your perspective and advice today. So thank you. Thanks, Amy. All right. Well, in addition to Crystal, we, or excuse me, uh, we're just about at the end of our, um, at, at the end of our day here. So in addition to thanking Crystal, I also want to thank our faculty presenters um, and their students who took time from their schedules to meet with us, who showed us tours around their lab spaces today, and also to our current SLU engineering students who um, uh, answered our questions and uh, helped inspire us during their panel session. And then finally, I want to send a huge thank you to you on the other side of the screen uh, for joining us and, and learning more about engineering today, for taking time out of your schedules. Um, we do hope that you uh, heard something interesting, that you learned more about the careers in the industry that maybe you hadn't thought about before. Um, and hopefully now you're excited to learn more about opportunities and careers available in engineering. So all of the sessions today have been recorded and they will be posted to our SLU Parks College YouTube page uh, in the next few days. And we'll email the link uh, to access those when they're available. And finally, for our students here, please don't forget that you can compete in our at-home innovation challenge in the next week. Uh, more information will be coming by email. 
uh, but you'll enter for a chance to win one of three Starbucks gift cards. Uh, so you will have, uh, students will have until March 7th to build and submit a photo or video um, in order to be entered into that competition. Okay, so we are just at noon now, and this brings us to the end of our virtual Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day 2021. We hope that in the future, when it's safe, you'll be able to come visit us on SLU's campus and learn more about the engineering programs at St. Louis University. In the meantime, please reach out to us at parksevents at slu.edu to set up a virtual lab visit or a guest speaker presentation from our faculty or current students. Thank you again and have a great